glad to have each of you. I thank God for Rabbi Greg and how God has used him so mightily since he's been here. I think I heard the second or third sermon he's ever preached, and I've heard every one I could hear after that because it's been such a blessing to hear in his message from the Hebrew point of view. And I had come back from the southern Georgia, American, England, France, Germany, point of view. So it was like a revelation to me. Rabbi Greg, God bless you and thank you for this glorious opportunity. And welcome to all of you who are online. Let's see that first slide, please. I want y'all to look at this word. And the reason I put this up here, I'm blind in my left eye. I got 20-20 in this vision. I can see back there, but I, I have trouble reading it when it's closed. Look at that word, Aesir, it had to borrow him. That is the word that is the Ten Commandments. And I gave you the scriptures down below it because that's the three places those words are used in the, old, in the first covenant. And that's what we're going to be talking about. You move that word head off the front of that word debar and that I am off the other end of it. And that's the debarium. It's God's spoken living word. <laughs> Woo! And it never fails nor turns back nor is void. You put the word rhema with that, and when you do that, you got the 241 times in the Old Testament when God spoke that word. But I can tell you this morning, since 1983, I've been trying to find, I cannot find any theologian, Jewish, Gentile, German, or whoever, who has ever written on those 10 words that God spoke. That word is used 241 times in the Old Testament. And 221 times are prophetic oracles. That means when God spoke it, something happened. <laughs> and the rhema word is in the New Testament, and it's used 70 times. So I wanted to share with you all this morning what God has told me and taught me in the last, since 1983. And I'm going to show you and prove to you by the scriptures and by historical fact that the Sabbath can never be changed to Sunday. But I want to ask you and plead with you, don't go out and beat people over the head with that. If you really want to beat them over the head with something, beat them over the head with love. You can scare the hell out of people, but you know, if you really get it done permanently, you got to love the hell out of them. And I've heard Rabbi Greg stand in this bema and beg you not to go out and treat, mistreat your family because they don't see what God has revealed to you. Did you know God told Micah, the revelation he gave to him said, Micah, don't even tell that to your wife because he, she didn't receive the revelation that he received. Therefore, she was at one place spiritually and he was at another place. So we have to share those revelation that God gives to us very carefully. Paul said his was so great he couldn't tell anybody about it. Well, most of the times people are telling you our visions that they have in their own head and not the living word of God. I want us to look at the next slide now. We're going to look at Exodus 34 in this passage here. And Moses said, and Adonai said to Moshe, write these words because they are the term of the covenant that I have made with you and with you and with you and with you and with Israel. When God makes a covenant, it's unbreakable unless you become disobedient. It's made with an oath, O-A-T-H. And only we can break that oath. God cannot break his oath. A lot of pressured Jews are living in Israel today, living like the devil. They're just as lost as a goose as anybody else is. If you don't believe it, go read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Paul said in Ephesians 1, you Gentiles were lost in ignorance. And then verse 2, he said, you Gentiles did what you wanted to do, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. Verse 3 said, and we Jews lived according to the lust of our flesh and of our mind. You break that covenant with God when you disobey. 
You can't claim God's power and God's deliverance when you're walking in disobedience. If you could, God would have to apologize to Yeshua for allowing him to die on the cross. Yeshua paid that price. So listen, here's what he said. Because these are the terms of the covenant which I have made with you and with Israel. Moshe was there without an hour 40 days and 40 nights, during which time he neither ate nor food nor drank water. Adonai wrote these tables, tables on words on stone of the covenant, the ten words. Now they're known as the ten words, the ten commandments, or the decalogue. That's a Latin term that has the same thing. Log means word, deck means ten. And I told you in my introduction that Bruce Filer, if you know if you've ever read it, he's working out walking through the Bible, or though this one is where God was born, and I told you I didn't like that term because God wasn't born. God existed from the beginning all the way unto the end. He has no birth. Now he did reveal himself to Abraham's father in Ur Chaldee. That's the first record. But Bruce Filer said in that book where God was born on page 196. These ten words are the first words that was ever written in the early Jewish beliefs and doctrine. And all the rest of it is commentary. God wrote these books. Next slide, please. Therefore, observe these things and follow them. For then all the people will see how you are having wisdom and understanding. Jeremiah said, you're a fool if you don't follow God. I use that in a friend of mine's church here in America. In, in Macon, it's a, we call y'all Americans of African descent. Y'all aren't Africans. Y'all are Americans of African descent. I'm an American of European descent. Some of my white honky friends said, why don't they go back to Africa where they came from? I look at him, I say, why don't you go back to England where you came from, or Germany where you came from? <laughs> Here's what it says. People see you walking in that thing will know that you have wisdom and understanding. When they hear all these laws or words, they will say, this great nation is surely a wise and understanding nation. You and I have been blessed to live in the most prosperous nation that's ever existed in the human history. Our forefathers walked in these words and laws and were made fun of, and you know what they called them back then? They called them Puritans. And that's what built this country we live in. These Puritans that believe when you told a man you're going to do a day's work, you're going to do eight hours of work. They were people of their word. When I was a child, all you had to do when you made a contract with a man, a deal with a man, just shook hands with him, and that was it. You didn't have to write any laws or sign any contract. Now you can't do anything without signing 10 or 12 pages of contract. Because there's so many liars living in America. (laughs) Our forefathers paid the price, and we have received the benefits. What of our children and grandchildren going to experience? Just what you're seeing done in the world today. The reason America's in such a state of confusion is because of the church failing to be what God called her to be. If you don't believe it, you go all the way back to 2 Chronicles and said, if my people who are called by my name, or that Hebrew says, on whom my name is called, will humble themselves and pray. And seek my face. I hear people quote this and they leave the next phrase off. And guess what it is? Turn from their sin. We want God to heal our land, but we don't want it bad enough to stop sinning. I was over preaching one time in Macedonia, and I looked at it and I, was, I just carried away. I said, when y'all going to stop sinning? Boy, they jumped like that, shocked them, you know. I said, no, no, I'm, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> Exodus 20, 20 tells us when we're going to stop sinning. It said, God has come to test you in order that you may love him enough 
to stop sinning. It's only when you love God more than you love those sins that you're going to stop sinning. You just can't quit. We fuss at the world out there because they sin. I heard a lady speak three minutes ago tomorrow. And she had lived a rough life. Her family was very uneducated. She was American of African descent. And she said, about 20 years ago, I got saved. And that new life in me would not allow me to live like I lived in that old life. Have you allowed God to put that new life in you? If you haven't, you're lost. I passed a church right out here in East Macon. One of the deacons had been a member of that church. He was a fine man that walked and graced the earth. 52 years, he was a deacon, Sunday school teacher. Of course, he and one of the other guys led the battle to get rid of me because I was a Pentecostal preacher, and they didn't want a Baptist preacher and a Pentecostal preacher in the Baptist church. I told them when they called me, I said, let me tell you something. I've been spirit-filled. I promise you something. I'll never preach anything in that pulpit that I can't show you two places in the Bible. So they got upset with me because I was spirit-filled. You ought to get up with every preacher that's not upset with every preacher that's not spirit-filled. Because he's in the ministry for the wrong reason. You can't even be a deacon if you look at what the scripture says without being spirit filled. You can't be a teacher or anything else without being spirit filled. So he says here, they will see this. They will hear what a great nation. They will say these law. This great nation is surely a wise and understanding people. Now here's what I want you to look. Here's a question. For what nation is there that has God as close to uh, them as us? But in the Hebrew it says, what great nation is there but has God, G-O-D-S, that word capitalized God, there's the word Elohim in the Hebrew. And it shouldn't be translated as God capitalized. It means slave, slave. Over in England, they call the upper class of the house of the what? Lords, that's the same word. So it says, what great nation is there that has Elohim, God, that's close to them, as Adonai, our God, is, well, say it with me. When we call upon him. You say, well, I haven't felt God lately. No wonder you haven't called on him lately. He's not going to come down and bless your mess. Till you confess. And when you confess, he'll forgive your mess and clean it up. you call on him. That's where the word in John 14, 15, 16 that's translated parakletos. It's P-A-R-C-L-E-T-O-S. It means call alongside. One day after I received the Holy Spirit, I got up that day and I was so busy, I was just doing everything. I was running, 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 you know. About four o'clock that afternoon, the devil just got all over me and I had a big, I was just miserable. I said, Lord, where are you? He said, well, I'm right where you left me this morning. (laughs) We make our plans. We do our thing. And then we ask God to bless it. You got to let him make your plans and do his thing. And you won't have to ask him to bless it. He'll be blessing you all over. When we call on him. All right, next slide, please. What great nation is there that has law and rules as just as this entire Torah? Right there, the writer of Deuteronomy tells you that the ten words had to bar in is the whole Torah. Everything else is commentary. Can y'all see that? Boy, can everybody see it? Read the next phrase with me. Only be careful. And, 
Wait a minute. Only be careful. And watch yourself. Guess what that Hebrew word is? Watch your soul. It's nephish in the Hebrew. N-E-P-H-E-S-H. It's nephish. Watch. Be careful. And watch your soul. If we watched our soul as much as we watch this body and took as much care of our soul as we do this body, I'm telling you, God would absolutely revolutionize this world he's living in. Look what it says. Only be careful. Some of the great German scholars got so sophisticated, they said the word soul was not a Hebrew word. It was a Greek word. And Plato and them talked about the soul being embodied, imprisoned in the body. And they said, that's not in the Old Testament. I don't know where in the world. Old Testament ain't been reading. Because there it is right there. <laughs> Only be careful. And watch over your soul. What? Diligently. Diligently. Not just casually. Not just on Shabbat. Reading the Word. We're going to get to that later. How much time you spend this last week watching over your soul? How much time this last week did you spend studying the Word of God? Reading the Word of God? You don't watch it over your soul. Ben and Gail experienced something that I experienced. The loss of a child. A man out in Lizella had a daughter. She was a little bitty child, but... About that high, she wasn't real short. Married a guy bigger than I was, weighed about 250 pounds. He's beating her. And this man decided he was going to kill her because every time he beat her, it got worse and worse. It's sadistic sickness of the mind. And he got his business straightened out and was going to kill him because if he said when he kills her, I'm going to kill him anyway, so I might as well kill him where she can live. She came off a Hartley Bridge Road one morning in her car going to work down that ramp before they changed it like it is now, ran into the back end of a car, and it killed her. Saved him from killing the man. He was going to kill him. Man, he meant it. He had put his, he retired. He put his business in order. He was going to kill him. I went out to Midway Church in 1986 and preached and taught what I'm preaching and teaching you. And only two or three people in the whole congregation in six years began to do what the Bible teaches us we need to do. Only be careful and watch over your soul diligently as long as you live so that you won't forget what you saw and with your own eye so that you won't vanish from your heart. Rather make them known to your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. And in September, I've got a great-great-great-grandson coming. You say, well, I'm just so busy. No, you're not. The reason you don't watch over your soul and read the Word of God, the devil's got you hoodwinked. Amen. You're welcome. If y'all don't, con- uh, con- uh, con- amen, my way, amen myself. <laughs> the devil's got you blinded, and I'm going to show you from the Scripture what he's doing. He's robbing you of what God has made available to you. Children, great-grandchildren, my granddaughter was somewhere in the neighborhood and said, Papa, I just want to come hear you. And I said, thank you, dear. Next slide, please. The day you stood before Adonai, your God, at Mount Moriah, and Adonai said to me, gather the people together, and I will make them hear my words. You say, well, people live out there like they don't know the word of God. Well, they live like they don't know it, but they've heard it. Because it said in Romans 10, 19, they have not heard how they, and Paul said, indeed they have. He quoted, he quoted uh, Psalms 19, verse 4. He said they have. They've heard it. If they didn't, if they hadn't, then God could not hold them accountable for their life on this earth. Somebody asked Hillier, the great Jewish philosopher and teacher, to tell me about God while you're standing on one Foot. He said, okay, don't do anything to anybody else that you don't want people to do to you. (laughs) 
That's simple. That's simple. I will make them. God did not create us without a capacity to know who he was. Now, I'm going to tell you something. All you got to do, go back in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14, read where Saul, who had been anointed with God, had prophesied in the Holy Spirit, let his wife lead him away from God. And the verse 16 said, and the Ruach HaKadosh left Saul in an evil spirit from that Elohim God, not Yahweh, Jehovah God, came upon him. It's a spirit of madness. I tell you to drive you mad. And the Ruach HaKadosh will drive you glad. <laughs> Woo! Some people tell me, you get too excited. Well, excuse me. You can go outside if you don't want to shout. I'll let you know when the next coming. I won't know. I won't eat it because I don't even know when it's coming. <laughs> the evil spirit, if you look at it, now look at our country. Any man that gets in a truck and drives down a road running over people and killing 84 people has got to be mad. He has allowed that evil spirit to comfort him. He's lost all sense of right and wrong and justice and mercy, and he kills people. He's mad. That evil spirit of the flesh and of the devil will drive you mad. And that Ruach HaKadosh will drive you glad. Somebody said, you're too happy. Well, don't tell me that because I'm going to get happier. I will make them hear my word in order that they will learn to hold me in awe as long as they live on this earth. I read in Time magazine just this last week that even people who were depressed, if they would go out in the woods and look up at the trees, they would have a sense of awe. It said that sense of awe heals them. And the trees give off some kind of Fragrance that keeps a mold from eating the tree up, and when they breathe that, that heals them. What did you say? They will remember me, and they will learn this, and they will hear it, and they will have that sense of awe. That sense of awe. Let's back up one slide. I think we, we moved there. We're going to need to go forward one. Y'all have heard rabbi so many times. Now go back again. I'm sorry. Y'all have heard rabbi, rabbi say so many times. Oh, they go around and say, it's awesome, it's awesome. He said, that is one of the names for God. And God will fill you with awe and wonder. Somewhere in the Testament it says, as long as you wonder, you'll survive. As long as you wonder about God and wonder about his revealing himself, you will survive. They learn to hold me in awe as long as they live so that they may teach their children. You approached and stood at the foot of the mountain and the mountain blazed with fire to the heavens with dark clouds and thickness in the mist. Next slide, please. And Adonai spoke to you out of the fire. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 says, John said, I baptize you with water, but he that's coming after me will baptize you in the Ruach HaKadosh and fire. When Adam and Eve sinned, God put them out of his holy presence out of the Garden of Eden and said, I put a holy sword, a flaming sword at the gate of the tree of life and the only way you can get back in there is you've got to go through the fire of the Ruach HaKadosh and the fire of the Debar Rehma words of God when you start going back in there God will open that door and he'll allow you to go in there came out of the fire you heard the sound of the word but saw no shape there was only a voice that still small voice that God's speaking is what we have to hear. That still small voice 
Sometimes he screams at you, and sometimes it's so soft that you can't hardly recognize it. But it's that voice of God speaking to you. I heard Brother Darren up here once about several times ago, and they were singing. He said, listen, while we're singing, you'll be hearing words that are not coming from us. When you're listening to God, you're going to hear words that's not coming from me. But they're coming from the voice of God speaking to your heart. If I didn't believe God was speaking to every one of your hearts today, you think I'd get up here at 87 years old and wear myself out trying to tell you about God? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? 87 years old, still getting to preach the gospel like a holy roll. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> he proclaimed his covenant to you, which he ordered you to what? Believe in? Or hear? No. What? To obey. You got to obey. There's that 10 words again. And he wrote them on two stone table. Those 10 words are written in stone. They're erasable, irrefusable, unbreakable, unchangeable. Even if they did change it from Saturday to Sunday. Woo. At that time, I ordered you to teach your laws and rulings so that you would live by them in the land where you are entering to take possession of it. If everybody that came to America had been doing what that word says today, instead of having such a crazy mixed up world like we've got and such a crazy mixed up political mess, this country would be the promised land. We had everything here we needed. In this country, we could provide everything we needed to survive. And yet we've diluted it and destroyed it and haven't lived by these laws. And some people today say, oh, there's no such thing as unconditional law. But I tell you, they are. And they always will be. We may be destroyed as a nation because we're breaking them. But you don't never break God's laws. You just break yourself over them. A nation don't ever break God's laws. They just break themselves over those laws. They're still God's laws after every nation that's been in existence has broken them and failed. Next slide, please. He inscribed the tablets with the same inscription as before. Now, you remember, God wrote the first Ten Commandments in ten words, and Moses broke them. He got mad because when he went out from the mountain with God, what had happened down in the valley? Aaron... And Miriam and the people that came out of Egypt decided they needed a God that they could see and not a God that was, was unseeable. So they said, uh, give me your rings and your watches and all your metal. He put them in the fire and made a God out of them. And they got to worship them and they had a sex orgy. The Bible said he let them loose from these ten words. And God heard it and said, Moses, what's going on? He went down and Moses broke those first two stones. And then Moses wrote the next stone. Look what it said. Ten words which Adonai proclaimed to you from the fire on the mountain the day of the assembly, and Adonai gave them to you. Now what is, if you're using a phone, like in a police car, and you're receiving a message, what is it they say when they get the message? Ten four. Look up here. <laughs> ten four. Ten four. What would I say? Six four. Five four. I'll do five of them, but I'm not going to do those other, other five. Nope. You've got to do them all. Because it said in the Testament, if you break one of them, you're guilty of breaking all of them. Doesn't it? Sure does. All right, let's go to the next slide. Now, this is in Luke chapter 3, verse 24. It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. We're going to be talking about that preparation day. Now, I'll tell you, T. Robinson, the rabbi quotes him quite a bit. In his commentary on volume 2 of his word picture of the New Testament, that it was sundown and not sunrise. Look what it said. The confusion is to us. And I'm going to tell you this morning, every one of you in here that's not 
doing your dead level best to live by these Ten Commandments, you are in a state of confusion. Oh, me. God help you to realize where the confusion is. It's not because your husband's not treating you right. It's not because your children aren't treating you right. It's because you're not living according to those rules and you're in a state of confusion. And you will stay in that state as long as you live outside the will of God. The confusion is to us in the West, not to the Jews, nor to the readers of what? The Greek New Testament. Next slide, please. There's that word, preparation day, paraskui. The name in modern day Greek today, if you went over there and asked them on our word Friday, what is the day? They say, paraskuni, the day of preparation for the Sabbath. Here in the Greek world, they are saying that the early church did not change the day of worship from the seventh day uh, to the uh, first day of the week. Because if they had, how would a country a thousand miles away from them adopted that word as that word for Friday? Preparation day. I'm going to ask you a question. Don't answer it out loud. Don't tell you why. How much preparation did you do today before you came here? Oh, I didn't have time to do anything. I was busy. I was doing this. I was doing that. Yeah, that's another one of them lies the devil tells you. Preparation day. You're supposed to prepare yourself. You're supposed to spend time in prayer. Praying yourself and preparing yourself. Now look what Dr. Robinson said in his big Greek grammar. It is a Hebrew idiom, idiom expressed by Mayim in the Septuagint. If it is a Hebrew idiom in the Masoretic text, which is the Old Testament in Hebrew, and the Septuagint, which is the XLXX, it is so also in the New Testament also. It's got to be the same thing. I was reading a book the other day. My daughter Judy sent me. It's called The Complete Gospel. And they had a translation in there that said SV. And I said, I wonder what that is. I hadn't heard about the SV translation. That's what that word SV means, translation. So I looked it up, and guess what it means? Scholarly version. I said, woohoo. They must have went back and read all the Hebrew and the Greek and everything. They're going to give a scholarly version. And look what they said about 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. The first day of the week has become Sunday. Not very scholarly, are they? Because when the scripture says it's unchangeable and it's a preparation day, it's many of the words. Virgil Duncan asked me about 10 years ago. He said, Billy, what do you think about worshiping on maybe 12 on Saturday instead of Sunday? And I looked at Virgil and I said, well, I'm a Judeo-Christian. I just work both days. I gave him that pat answer. That sounded so good. About two weeks later, I woke up one one morning about 4.30, and the Lord said, if it's the first day, it's got to be, in the Greek, it had to be, hey, he, mira, the first day. I said, boy, that's what the Greek said in 1 Corinthians 16. I got an unbreakable answer for Virgil. I jumped up, and I couldn't wait to get my Greek New Testament and look at it. When I got the New Testament and looked at it, it was M-I-A, Sabbath. That Hebrew term that they used in the New Testament. I'm surprised now as I go back and read a lot of the books and things, I'll say they say, that is a Hebrew term. Well, that's Hebraic. Well, that's Hebraism. Well, I heard a man speak about four weeks ago, and he said, What we got to do, we got to go back and learn the Jews' way. And I wanted to get up and say, No, sir, we got to go back and learn God's way. See, when people say that word Jews, well, they, they say, well, the Jews created this. No, the Jews didn't create it. God manifested and spoke it to Moses. It's God's way. Can I say the rest of that word? Or no way? Your way. What did, who was that? Frank Sinatra said, I've done it my way. Yeah, boy, America's done it our, the other way. Most of us have done it our way and made a mess out of it. It's God's way or your way. It's not done any different. 
So that word power, excuse me, up there is that day of preparation for the Sabbath. The Greek language of modern day. We had a, a lady from Greece visited Bethany Shua here. She worked at a bank here in town. I heard about it. And I went down and asked her about it. And I said, what is the word for Friday in Greece? She said, Paul excuse me. So here, if they'd been worshiping for 50 or 60 or 70 years before they got to Greece, they would not have adopted that word. They were worshiping on the Sabbath and did up till Constantine changed it in 325. Those scholarly versions, they came out several years ago and called themselves the Jesus Seminar. Now I'm going to say this, and I hope it don't hurt your feelings, but it's the truth. Most of them are Catholic scholars. They're teachers at Notre Dame. All the Catholic colleges here in America. They put this book out that my daughter bought, Complete Bible. Well, I won't tell you something, brother. They didn't have to put it out. God put it out a long time ago. We got it. We got it. All we got to do is just read it and remember it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Number four said, and that's what we observe the day of the Sabbath to set it aside as holy. For I am Adonai who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, what? Be holy. Be holy as I am holy. How can we have fellowship with him when we're living in the flesh and in sin and he's holy and he threw Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin? And I tell you, if you're living in the flesh, you're outside of his holiness and you're a miserable mess. Amen. You're welcome. Oh, you say, well, that's in the first covenant. Well, let's go look at the 1 Peter chapter 15, 1 verse 15. Brother Dwayne used this last week, and he, didn't he do a wonderful job? Thank you, Brother Dwayne. That was wonderful. Thank you for that preparation. On the contrary, following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourself. That's not an option. In the Greek, every time they use the subjunctive term, it was an imperative. It's something you must do if you're going to walk in God's Holy Spirit. You must allow that Holy Spirit to be constantly making you and helping you not to become holy in yourself, but to become a temple in which the holiness of God can live. I'm going to show you the beauty of this in just a minute. I've got to hurry along. Come holy. You are to be holy. Now go back up and look at that. Because come holy yourself in your what? Entire way of life. We got the entire Torah of God. And here he's saying in your entire way of your life. I got a little great nephew who lives up in Franklin, Tennessee. He's watching today. He's 27 years old. When he was about 10 or 12 years old, his mother was dressing him to go to church. He's got a learning disability. He looked up at him and said, Mama, Please pray for me that I can learn. It just melted his mother's heart because she was an honored graduate from the University of Tennessee, a brilliant scholar, brilliant mind. I'm going to tell you something. Tripp's got the most awesome consciousness of God of anybody I've ever seen. They lived in their first home there in Franklin. Their next door neighbor got diagnosed with cancer. Everybody was talking about it. He's going to go to follow up. You know what Tripp did? He went over to his house. Laid hands on him. Prayed for his healing. And his wife said she believed just as much as she's breathing. That when Tripp laid his hand on him, God healed him of that cancer. Wow. Tripp's one of the most awesome people I've ever seen. He'll go to a ball game. He'll find a preacher or somebody to attend the ball game. He'll go to up that preacher and say, let's pray. Boy, they pray out on the ball field. They pray up in bleachers. His mom was so brilliant scholarly. I knew it, but she didn't say it for a long time. He said, it used to embarrass me to death when Tripp said that. But so now when he said it, I said, let's pray, everybody. Tripp's going to pray. God bless you, Tripp. I was praying one time, God glorify yourself in Tripp. You know what God told me? He said, you've done me you. I've already been glorifying myself in him. <laughs> I said, oh, just keep it up. <laughs> there it is. In all your ways, you are to be entire holy. Now, in the King James said, in your conversation. Well, when they translate that in 1611, it meant both your conversation and your conduct. But it got in our language just to mean talk. 
And I'm telling you the God truth. All the religious talk goes on in America today was the God's Holy Spirit speaking our nation would be revolutionized. All right. Your way of life, since the Tanakh says you are to be holy because I'm holy. Let's go to the next verse. Now, now we get to my sermon. Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah also loves the church and gave himself up for, up, gave himself up for her. Back in the verse before that, it says, Wives, honor your husband, submit yourself to him. But in the verse before that, it says, Submit yourself together unto the Lord. Men go around demanding their wives be submitted to them, they mean it's the devil. That ain't what the word says. Husband, we even have a greater commitment. We're supposed to die for our wives. Just like Christ died for us. Now, why did he die? Look at that phrase after that. In order that he might what? Sanctify her. I call Roxanne. Thank you, Roxanne, for putting that in for me. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 15, 6 and 7. Having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the rain of word. Paul is writing about a wedding. He said a bride, before she gets married, she goes has her pedicure, isn't that what you call them? You get your nails and, and everything cut. She fixes her hair and she washes her body. She wouldn't dare go to her wedding unclean. Well, now the wedding supper of the lambs is going to be in the future, but I'm going to tell you something. The bridegroom is preparing the bride while we're down here, and he's sanctifying us when we're alive, too. I read somewhere the other day, said, all believers are going to heaven, but the people who are being sanctified live in heaven down here on earth. <laughs> you want to live in hell? Just keep it up. You're doing it. You got a choice. Not only a choice, but a way. There's that Raymond word. In order that he might have present to himself a church. And look what that word in his glory. And the Greek said that he may present to himself a glorious church. Did you know what? When you let God sanctify you and the Holy Spirit dwell in your life, you're presenting yourself to God as a holy church. Can you imagine you being a gift to God? I've heard all my life about God's gift to us. When you allow that Ruach HaKadosh to begin to sanctify you, you become a gift to God. God will come down and bless you and live in you. Bless your life. He may have present a church, himself to church, in a glorious church, having no spot or wrinkle of such thing, but that she is having been sanctified by the Ruach HaKadosh, blameless. Did you know that word, having been sanctified by the Ruach HaKadosh, did you know your prayers cannot really be prayers until they become sanctified with the Ruach HaKadosh? You're just saying a bunch of words. You can read the uh, liturgy of all the churches and say all the prayers you want to, but it's un- until that Word that's coming out of your heart and your mind is being sanctified by the Ruach HaKadosh that it really becomes prayers. Listen, that move heaven on behalf of the earth. Sanctified by the Ruach HaKadosh, having no spot or wrinkle and such thing. But having been sanctified by the Ruach HaKadosh, so husbands ought to love their wives and their own bodies. Whoever loves his wife loves himself. And no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it. Let's go to the next slide, please. You say, well, if God's not nourishing my body, here's the reason he's not. First Timothy 4, 6 said, and pointing out these things, he said, in setting these things before the brothers, you become a good servant of Messiah Yeshua. Do you really want to be a good servant of Messiah? Here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. Constantly nourished on the words of faith and sound teachings which you have been following. Most of you all throw about three-fourths of the books you got in your home away. Any book that don't teach you how to read and understand the Bible is not worth reading. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. All them tapes and things you're listening to, they're not worth the time. 
I, I thought about it, recommended to Rabbi, we have all the books and all the tapes brought here, and have a book burning and a tape burning of all these testimonies and everything that, that don't mean anything because it's not the Word of God. Many of them are visions that come out of man's heart and they stand up and brag and boast like they were able to do these miracles. Nursed on the word. Now that word there in the word is the word uh, for gospel. It's logos. So you got to be reading that logos word and studying it and that the bar word before the real country of death can speak that living the bar word and the rhema word in your soul and spirit. Be careful. Guard your soul. Guard your soul. Read that word. You ought to read the Bible at least an hour a day. Amen. You're welcome. Oh, you just don't know how busy I am. <laughs> no, the devil's got you hoodwinked. I'm going to tell you something. If you start reading that word and praying, I guarantee you God will give you time to do what you're doing and have spare time left. One great missionary, I believe it was Livingston, said, I have so much to do, I have to get up in the morning before I start and read the Word and pray two hours. We jump up out of the bed and run all day and don't read the Word of God. We aren't nourishing ourselves. Think about how much time we spend nourishing our bodies, eating. A lot of time. A lot of time. Here it is. Nourish yourself on the Word of God. Hebrews 6, 4, 5 says, for in case of those who have been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gifts. Ooh, I never will forget when I dated my first wife and kissed her and tasted her. Boy, I was drunk on love for 49 years from that one. <laughs> Did you know you can taste the word of God and it'll make you drunker than anything you've ever been drunk on before in your life? We hadn't been married about three months. We worked third shift. She got in the car on Saturday morning crying. I said to her, I said, what's wrong? I said, my boss has been talking to me all night, ugly about sex. When we got to the house, I said, get out of the car. I'll be back in a little bit. She wouldn't get out of the car. That was Saturday. That was Friday morning at 7 o'clock. So I didn't get away, but I went to work Sunday night at 11 o'clock. I got my looms all running at 2 o'clock. I walked upstairs where my wife was working. They had a big door. It was a gangway between the buildings. I went in. I found her boss. I said, I'd like to talk to you out here in the gangway a minute, please. We walked out in the gangway. I looked him straight in the face, and I said, my wife got in the car Saturday, Friday morning, crying because you'd been talking ugly to all night about sex. I said, I'm going to tell you something, mister. You say anything you want to about her job but that better be the last thing you ever say to about sex. Taste the Word of God. And I tell you, when you do all those little sins and frivolous things you're dealing with, they'll lose their taste. They'll start tasting like sour lemons or something else. Taste the Word of God. Made partakers of the heavenly gifts. Having tasted, enlightened, having tasted the heavenly gifts and having been made partakers of the Holy Ghost. You can never become holy. I hear people going and say, I'm holy. Well, I wish you were, but you really aren't. You can partake of God's holiness, and he will literally come down and live in your body. If you'll nourish yourself on the word of God. All right, back to the next past slide, please. Now, the next one, go backwards to two. Okay, here it is. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. All of us are mad because everybody didn't cherish us as much as we cherished ourselves. They hurt us, and we don't forgive them. We hurt people. We don't forgive them. That's the reason we're not forgiven. <laughs> the Bible teaches very plainly, before you can be forgiven, you've got to forgive. Cherish. Yes. Let's go back to that next slide, please. There's the word cherish down at the bottom. See it? First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cherishing her child. 
Heather, come up here. She's going to help me preach my sermon. When I got up, we read the scripture together today. I looked around. And I said, oh, my sermon's not here. Heather, I want you to stand right up here because you're kind of short. I want everybody to see. How old is your son? How? What's his name? Asher. What? Asher. Asher? Mm-hmm. God bless you, Asher. Stand right up there. You see what that thing is she's got on there? It's called a mobile. The Indians used to wear that. I saw them back in the 60s when the hippies started wearing those things. I saw them, those kids asleep in those things about to fall out. They sound asleep. She got that child, Asher, wrapped up next to her body. She is cherishing that child and nursing that child. The first voice he ever heard, Asher ever heard, was her voice. The first sound she ever heard was her heartbeat. The first body she ever smelled was her body. That's what God wants to do for you and me. Thank you, Heather. God bless you. God bless you. Now let's go back to that past slide. Come back to it. I use this verse of scripture. I started using it. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1970. Right after that, every marriage I used, that was 1970, up until about three months ago, I used this passage of scripture. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nursed it and cherished it. I have a daughter who had four major surgery with Crohn's disease. And unless God does a physical miracle. She's going to beat me to heaven again. i got to start trying to live right. That'll be four children and three wives until the Lord told her to took away from I want to show you what this says. Two or three months ago, I read the next phrase. It, cherish it, nourish and cherish, just as what? Messiah does the church. What he wants to do is take you up and wrap you up in his love and in his real cockadish. I never heard a cry from a child that was in that mobile. And I've never heard a Christian cry that was wrapped up in God's holiness and God's love. I've never heard them be ugly. Talk about people. Y'all know y'all about to drive Rabbi Greg crazy with this middle Georgia religion? Cause y'all to come here on, on Shabbat and worship and go out and talk and back by it all week. Come back on the next of the week. I never heard a person that's wrapped up in God's rule, Chakadev, and His love. That does that. God wants to allow you to allow Him to be your mobile. Wrap you up. I'm telling you the truth. I've been feasting on that bit about three, two or three, four weeks ago. I never read it. I never read that next phrase. As Messiah nourishes and cherishes the church. Oh, my goodness. How you get there, preacher? I just showed you. You've got to start obeying those Ten Commandments. You've got to start obeying the Holy Spirit. You've got to start nourishing yourself on the Word of God. And when you do, you're going to find yourself being wrapped up next to the heart of Yeshua Messiah. You're going to feel his love. You're going to hear his voice. You're going to feel his heartbeat. And when you do that, I'm going to tell you there's nothing in this life that's worth giving that up for. Because it's living in this next phrase, please. Next phrase. Resting in Adonai's holiness. Elizabeth, would you go up and play that for us? So, brothers, we have confidence to use this way into the holiest. It's plural in the Greek. I had to go back and look it up. It's H O L I E S. Holiest. The holiest. It don't depend on you what you have done. It depends on what Yeshua Messiah has done for you. Pray that phrase, Elizabeth, when you get chained there. Resting in His holiness. It's in that song we sung about, hear the right word of God speak. And when you do that, you know what you can do? I 
I want to get over here where most of you see me. You can sit down and rest in this hole. Just over a year ago, my wife Betty beat me home. Her desire was to outlive me because I'd outlive two wives. When she began to have problems, I began to pray and I said, Lord, you know Betty and you know me, you know what our needs are. You know which one of us can survive best by ourselves. I'm just going to commit it in your hand and ask you, God, to take care of me. God called her home. Boy, I sure have missed her. She was a prayer warrior and a prophet. My other two wives were good women and good Christians, but Betty had that call from God. and She ministered the word to me, and I told you when the first time we talked on the phone, she told me, she said, I just love the way you wash me in the water of the word. That rhema word of God, wouldn't you nourish yourself? And the word of God, cherish God. You can rest in his holiness. Rest in his holiness. That's what God's trying to do in every one of your lives. You say, oh, but preacher, you just don't know what I've done. You don't know my life. No, and I don't want to know it. But I know what Yeshua has done and will do. And is doing for everybody that allow him to wrap themselves up. And that putting on the whole arm of God. You know what the last piece is there? Put on love which binds it all together. The Ruach HaKadosh and the holiness of God. In Romans chapter 1 verse 4, Paul used an unusual Hebrew word, a Greek word. It said, in the spirit of holiness. It's Hageusini in the Greek. Only used three times in the scriptures. In the spirit of holiness. Because when that Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, if he stays in there, you're going to have to let that holiness begin to manifest itself in your life and through your life. One of the ways you can tell when you're not allowing that is you lose that holiness. I saw somebody the other day and they said to me, Having lost, they didn't lose them. They just went home to be with the Lord. Three children and three wives. Why are you so happy? I said, I tell you why. Because I stayed drunk in the Holy Ghost. I'm either getting drunk or getting over a drunk or trying to get drunk. You say what you want to do. Do what you want to do. It don't matter to me. As long as I have breath in this body and with the aid and power of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to walk in obedience to God. I'm going to teach His Holy Word. I may never get to speak again. When you're my age, you don't never know when that last time will come. Right by grave said right up here about six months ago, maybe a year ago, that preaching a sermon like I preached this morning takes as much energy as running a marathon. I don't know how many more marathons I have in me, but I sure have enjoyed this one. That word place is not in the Greek. It says, so brethren, we have confidence to use, to use the way into the holiness opened up by what? Somebody say it. Blood of Yeshua. It's not what you've done or what you didn't do. It's not your past life and your past sins. In Psalms 32, I think it's first sigh, David said, I confess my sins, and God lifted the guilt of my sins off of my back. I see so many of uh, y'all walk around here with you. All you got to do is just confess them. Let him lift them off. You know, if you're genuinely born again, all your sins are on the blood anyway. Yeah. It's by the blood, yeah. through the power of the Ruach HaKadosh, that you can enter into God's holiness. God help you. I wanted to get this out, that you can't change worshiping from Sabbath to the first day of the week. And anybody that translates that word is mistranslating the Hebrew. I showed you Dr. A.T. Robinson, the great Greek scholar, that it's a Hebrew idiom. 
But I want to challenge you not to just be holy when you hear Betsy Shula. When you get up and walk out the door, say, we just come here to worship and to be strengthened and to be filled with the Ruach HaKadosh. Our ministry starts when we get out of here and go out and get in our car and go out in the community. And glorify and magnify Christ. Brother Dave, would you come? Would you please stand? I'm going to say the New Testament benediction, and David is going to say the ironic benediction. Y'all move in and join him. This is Paul's benediction in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the last verse. It said, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ruach HaKadosh go with you, be with you. So that's my prayer for you this morning. And this beautiful, ironic blessing and prayer that, that Dave's going to give is praying this on you. I hope you get this print out and read it and study it. And I hope you get on that way of holiness. It's a highway. Isaiah 38.5 says, There is a highway of holiness, and a mentally retarded or difficult learning child will never be able to miss it. If Trip Abner can find it and walk in it, Every single one of you here can find it and walk in it. I challenge you. You won't lose a thing when you give up those little petty sins you got in your life. God will deliver you from them. You'll gain God's holiness and you can live your life resting in his holiness. David. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you Hallelujah. Peace. Thank you, Lord. Ivareke Karanai, Beish Mareka, Yo Erna Panabeleka, Behuneka, Isarna Panabeleka, Via Simleka, Shalom. We'll have intercessors down here to pray with you if you need a prayer. Want to be on both sides.